Hello and welcome to the God's Words Bible Study and as usual we'll start with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you Lord for your many mercies towards us and we pray Lord that as we seek to know more of you by studying your word that you will draw close to us and that you'll teach us and guide us and use us Lord to glorify your name. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're on the book of 1 John, where we are doing an expositional Bible study, meaning that we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And the last time we met, we finished up 1 John chapter 3. And so this week, we're going to be starting on 1 John chapter 4. And for that, we're going to read the first 13 verses. So let's go. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false spirits are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us, he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man had seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. Amen. Amen. And so, chapter 4 starts, Beloved. And what did we say about Beloved? That is John's favorite greeting to the saints. Beloved. Beloved of who? Of God. Beloved of God. Beloved of Christ. Beloved of John. Beloved of each other. And so he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Now, these spirits that he's talking about, are these little spooky Casper kind of spirits that, ooh, is that the spirit that he's talking about? He's talking about people who are coming to try to convince them otherwise. He's talking about every person that you meet that has something to say about God. And he's saying that no matter how articulate they are, no matter how educated, no matter how renowned, that you should do what Paul said of the Bereans, which is to listen and then compare what you have heard to the scripture. That's how you test the spirit. There is no other way to test the spirits. It is whatever you hear compared to the word of God. Because the spirit of God is in the word of God. And so he says, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit. Now when you say, but try the spirit, what he's saying is that don't just dismiss people because you disagree with them. You have to try them. And again, the trying is the comparison to the word of God. Exactly. So when they say something, your response shouldn't be, that's not what I believe. Your response should be, where are you getting that from the Bible? Where in the Bible is that? Right. And once they show you, then that's when you compare scripture with scripture. Because remember, God has not always put things very plainly in the Bible. What he said is that he has hidden these things. It is his prerogative to hide these things. And it is our privilege to search them out. 
So sometimes we might think we know something, but we only know a part of the truth. And so when we hear the full truth, we recoil and he said, no, try the spirit. Because the only way for you to grow in your Christianity, the only way for you to get wiser, to get more knowledgeable about the things of God, is for your current positions to be offended. Okay, so when someone says something that is not in line with what you believe, you might be wrong, I might be wrong. So we have to test it to see whether it be of God. Like we said in the previous lessons, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Right. So we have to go and search the scriptures to see if it's so. Right. Now, let me put something to you that you have probably never heard anyone say before. And it has to do with what spirit do we test? The first spirit that we test is the Bible itself. We have to go into the Bible and we have to know that the Bible is true. And it's very simple to test it, but only if you read it. Because most of us, when it comes to the scripture and when it comes to the things of God, we are no more than gossips. We are only repeating what we heard other people say. Okay. Okay? So once we ascertain that the Bible is true, which I've done for myself and which you should do for yourself, then it means that God is true. You right. see that? And once you find out that God is true, then you do the same thing with the prophets. You do the same thing even with Jesus. When Jesus says, I am the Son of God, was he speaking the truth? And most of us, I would say 99% of Christians, the only way they know to answer that is, the Bible says that he is. But that's not good enough, folks. You have to go back and you have to know that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies and how he fulfilled them. Because that is the only true test that he is who he said he is. Not because he healed some people. The Bible tells us that Jesus himself tells us that in the last days, the devil is going to perform many, many miracles. He is going to be so persuasive, both with miracles and with speech and with signs and wonders, that if it was possible, he would deceive even the very elect. Now, why is it not possible to deceive the very elect? Because they'd be so entrenched in the word of God, they would be able to see the deception. Exactly, because that's our only defense. That's as though when Jesus was tempted of the devil, he always said, it is written. He's going back not to, I feel, or I think, or I believe. No, no, none of that. It is written. Thou shalt. You see? And that's the same way that we are supposed to be. Now, when we talk about testing the Bible to make sure that the Bible is true, that is, as I mentioned before, is just another way of saying testing God to see if he's real. And God always invites us to do this. Now, there are two ways of testing God, isn't there? There is wrestling with God to find the truth. And then there is... Prove me now. I'm coming to that, actually. That's my next text. Then there is the testing God as in a doubtful way. You're trying to prove that he is not who he is. Okay, so there's two types of testing. So, for example, I remember there's a story in the Bible where God says through the prophet to the king, test me, any test, and I'll prove to you. And the king said to the prophet, no, I'm not going to do that. And we might look at it and say, oh, he's so faithful. But no, that was open rebellion because what he was saying is that I really don't care if he is or if he isn't. I'm going to go do what I'm going to do. And that, folks, is where God says he himself will give the king a sign. And then he talked about the virgin shall have a child, sending his only begotten son. So, folks, we have to be very careful that we test God in the right way. And God invites this. For example, when God says... Come, let us sit down and reason together. What do you think God is talking about? God is saying, yeah, I know that you have your doubts. I know that you have your opinions and I know you have your struggles. But come on, let us sit down and reason together and discuss these things. And I will show you what is true. You see, he's inviting us to test him. And the verse that my wife just referred to is in Malachi. And in Malachi... A lot of us think that Malachi is about tithes and offering. It is not. 
the book of Malachi is about God wooing his people back to him because they do not believe. Mm-hmm. And in the midst of him telling them about their stiff-necked, rebellious ways, he says to them, hey, listen, do this test. Test me in this. And this test is found in Malachi 3, verses 10 and 11. And so let's look at that. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. So you see, God says to them, listen, prove me in this. Bring your tithe, even though I know you're struggling, even though I know that you're worried about tomorrow. Bring your tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. And when you say meat in my house, what God is talking about is that there may be food in his house for the Levite as well as for the poor. So that when you are in Israel and you're hungry, you can always go to the house of God for a meal. That's what God's talking about. He's talking about something practical. But he said, if you bring your tithe, he's going to do some stuff for you. He is going to open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And you won't have room enough in your life to receive all the blessing. In other words, some of the blessing is just going to go to waste. One of the ways that God expressed this in the Bible, he says that, You're going to have to throw out your old store because the new harvest is coming in. You see? Because remember, this is an agricultural society and you used to farm and store it and then eat it during the winter and throughout the growing season and hopefully make it to the next harvest. And God said, no, no, no. When I bless you, you're going to have so much that you're going to have to throw out the old stuff to make room for the new stuff. And so God is saying here, test me in this. Test me in the simple practical test and see if I don't do what I'm going to say. And once you see that I do what I say, then you can trust me in the more spiritual aspects. You see, God is starting at our level, but he's trying to get us up to him. And so once we have tested the Bible and tested God and secured our faith in him, then as I said, the next test that we have to test is Jesus. Is he the promised one? But we don't stop with Jesus because once we know that Jesus is who he says he is, then there's some other people that we have to test, isn't there? We have to test our pastors and elders and teachers and finally ourselves. Because that is why John says, Beloved, believe not every every spirit, spirit, but try the spirits whether they be of God. That includes everybody who purports to represent God. Thus saith the Lord. And so, let's go to Luke chapter 9, verses 53 to 55. And this is about testing ourselves. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And so, this, folks, is when Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's going through Samaria. And when they found out that he was going to go to Jerusalem, they didn't want to accommodate him in their towns. Go on, 54. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? And he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Amen. So when hospitality was not extended to Jesus by the Samarians, James and John were so incensed, so insulted, that they were treating Jesus like that, that he said, hey, you want us to call down fire from heaven? And Jesus turned around and he probably just shook his head. You guys don't know what manner of spirit you're of. Now, mark you, they thought that they were righteous and that they were doing the right thing. And Jesus had to rebuke them. No, the spirit that you're manifesting right now, that's not of God. That's of the evil one. You see that? And a lot of us folks, and this is why I said after you test the Bible and you test God and you test Jesus and you test your pastors and your elders and your teachers, you have to test yourself because you might be the problem. I might be the problem. Okay? And so Jesus rebuked them because in their zeal 
to do the things of God, they ended up doing the things of the devil. And this again is why the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us that in the last days, there are some people who are going to kill you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to lock you up. They're going to beat you. And they're going to think that they're doing God's service. All right. So let's go to our next verse. First John chapter four, verse two. And it say, hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereby ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Now, if you remember, we already went over the Antichrist, right? Mm. We went over it when we looked at 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 to 23. Let's just do a quick recap. Uh, well, well, let's just look at the verses that we have in front of us. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now hold on. This is not just saying that if somebody say, Yeah, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he's of God. Because remember, the devil was a liar from the beginning. And he will say anything that he needs to say in order to mess you up. So when you say that you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, what it's saying is not just, just that you say the words, but that you live the life. Right. By their fruit, you will know them. All right? And he says that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And as we discussed earlier in these studies, that when I talk about the flesh here, it's not saying that you confess that Jesus Christ was human. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about his physical being. What it's talking about is his nature. That his nature was fleshly. His nature had the propensity to sin. His nature was that of fallen Adam, not of angels. Remember, we went through all of this, folks, if you remember. And if you don't remember... Go back and look at that study because this is very important. When the Bible tells us that Jesus humbled himself and became a man, folks, it was not a pretense. He actually became one of us in every single way that you can think about. When he came here and walked among us, he was one of us. He wasn't one of us plus. I know that that is a popular Christian belief that he was 100% human and 100% God. But when you know that we're not talking about his physical being, then you know that that's impossible because when you're talking about his nature, his nature can either be one or the other. Or the other. It can't be both. Okay? So when we talk about his nature, Jesus came in the flesh. Jesus came as one of us. And verse 3 and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. So anybody, and folks, this is where me and the church is now at loggerhead. Because they are going to say he was human plus. And I'm going to say no. He was human. He came in the flesh. He came and his nature was a fallen Adam. And we went over all of these verses, for example. He took not on himself the nature of angels, but the nature of Abraham. Right? And it talks about that he took the same nature on himself that we had. He became one of us. And of course, if you're watching this, it's on the screen. But catch this, folks. It says, this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, why is it Antichrist to say that Jesus was human plus? The reason why, folks, and I'm just reiterating what we have gone over, is that in order for Jesus to redeem us, he had to be a near kinsman. And Satan had the right to test him to see if he was something other than what we are. And if Satan had found that he was something that was not us, Satan would have rejected that transaction because he would have the right because he would not be a near kinsman. But when Satan examined him, all Satan found was a man and only a man. 
So the now, class that you could say that Jesus says was the Holy Spirit, which we also have access to if we are of Right, God. right. And the Bible says God gave him the Holy Spirit without measure. And he gives it to us with measure. But here's what that means, folks. When Jesus Christ was walking the earth, God could just trust him with the Holy Spirit. God could just give him the Holy Spirit and turn his back. With us, eh, God has to give us a little and make sure that it doesn't overwhelm it us. doesn't overwhelm it doesn't crush us and then when he sees that we can bear that then he gives us a little more and but mark you he is willing to give us the holy spirit in the same measure that he gave it to Jesus, Jesus Christ it's just that we can't handle it that's that's it that's the only difference between us and Jesus is that Jesus was able to lift more weight than we can can't handle it <laughs> all right so Let's continue. So here's what it says. And hereby, talking about the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, hereby you have heard that it should come. And even now already is it in the world. So this thing in order to discredit the humanity of Jesus Christ was there from day one. Because Satan knows that that's his only real defense. He had to be able to say that Jesus Christ wasn't who Jesus Christ was. Now, here's why this is important to us. I've told you why it's important to God, why it's important to the devil, but why is it important to me? Well, here's where it gets important to me. Jesus Christ is my only example or my chief example because we have many examples because we have all those faithful disciples who have come before us. But Jesus Christ ultimately is my chief, only example. And if Jesus Christ could live this life perfectly without sinning once, and he is everything that I am and nothing more, then so can I. But if Jesus Christ is human plus, he can't be my example because he has an advantage that I don't have access to. You see that, folks? So some people will tell me that, oh, you know, you show them the scripture and they do not believe. And then two days later, they come back and say, oh, I believe because the spirit of God appeared to me and told me that this is true. Well, I can't deal with you. Because you can't be my example because you have something that I don't have. You have some kind of spirit telling you that the Bible is true when the Bible is plainly saying something. You, you understand what I'm saying? And then you come out and you call yourself, oh, or prophets or apostles or whatever. No, 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 no. You're frauds. You have something that disqualifies you from being an example or a teacher for me. Now, here's what I'm saying. Now, listen, folks. The Son of God, the righteous one, the one who made heaven and earth can be my example because we are very much alike. In nature. In nature. But some of you can't be my example because you don't need to use the brain that God gives you to see what God says. You have some spirit interpreting for you. And when that happens, hey, I know what spirit you are of because... As the Bible says, we test the spirit. So verse 4, ye are of God, little children. And the little children here are the beloved, right? Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And folks, mark you what it says. It doesn't say you will overcome them. You have overcome them. Now, catch this. The moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you won. You haven't played the match yet. You haven't fought the battle yet. You haven't wrestled yet. But you have won. You see that, folks? Because Jesus is the victory. And if you have Jesus, you have victory. It's as simple as that. Remember, when we fight against the darkness, when we fight against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places, it is not us who are doing the fighting. As God has said so many places in the Bible, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
It is Jesus Christ that fights the battle for you. Our greatest fight is to submit to the one who died for us. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen, amen. Who says, and have overcome them? Is that talking about those people who are of the spirit of Antichrist? Exactly. Talking about those who have tested their spirit and they are the, of the Antichrist. They are no danger to us. Now, folks, that doesn't mean that they can't harm us. It means that even if they harm us, even if they kill us, we still win. Because we can't lose. They can't deceive us. They can't deceive us because we know that they are frauds. So it goes on and it says, Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so let's read that again and just put in the names so that we know who the he's are here. Because greater is God who is in you than the devil that is in the world. You see that, folks? What it's saying here is that, listen to me, Christian folks. What it's saying here is that you have no excuse for sinning. Because a lot of us like to use the excuse in one way or another that the devil made me do it. If that is true, you were never a Christian. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How can you have the champion sitting in your heart and you're stumbling all over the place like a drunkard being slapped around by the devil who is a wee willy one? Eh? Let's see how great this God is who is in us. Romans chapter 8, 35 to 39 and it says, catch this force, this is, greater is he that is in you. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. You see, folks, we dead, but we win. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, folks, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. There is nothing in this world that can pluck you out of the hand of God. And we continue. Next verse. 1 John chapter 4, verse 5, and it says, They are of the world. Who is they here? The Antichrist, those who have tested their spirit and found that they are not of God. They are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Now, folks, I can't tell you how much time I've been in church and I've come up against the spirit. I will say things and I will see it just grates the wrong way on these people. But we are in church. They cannot receive the truth because they are not of the truth. And then somebody will come in and they will lie to their face and they'll just swallow it. And I always tell people, you got to listen, especially when you're in church, you got to listen critically. Not of a critical spirit, but you have to listen critically. You have to make sure that your guards are up. Why? Because when you're in church, oh, you know, this renowned pastor is coming to preach to us or this elder that we like so much. When we listen to these people preach or teach or speak, you know what happened? And this is proven scientifically. Our guard goes down. That area of our brain that filters out truth, that question things, shut down. It's like music. Music has that ability to... Music has a way of getting through these filters and going right in our brain, which is why we can sing songs that we have never really truly even listened to. It's the same way with some of these pastors, because we exalt them, because we look at them as professionals, Expert. experts. We let our guards down because they know what they're talking about. But these people, some of these people are devils. And any pastor that tells you that you can't question him, 
is a devil. Because the God that he purports to serve said that you can question him, God, and the Savior that he says he represents, Jesus, also said that you can question him. So why can't I question the pastor whose only duty is to teach me what God, what God said? So folks, we have to be very careful with these people. And when they come in, when these counterfeit pastors come in and they preach, the church go wild. Why? Because they are of the world and the world, sitting in the pews, hear them. Verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And folks, so let me explain how this works in my life. Whenever I start teaching or preaching and I see these people who are not hearing me, sticking to how the Bible describes it, who are not hearing me, folks, I have no contention with them. Why? Because we are not of the same kingdom. I will be cordial. If they ask a question, I will answer it. I will try my best to show them the truth. But ultimately, I'm not going to get in a big argument with them because they are not... Shake the dust off. <laughs> they are not of the same spirit that I am of. They are not of God. And as my wife said, you just shake the dust off your feet. However, every now and again, I will meet a Christian who is of God, but is having difficulty digesting some of the things of God. And with that person, I will sit down and I will take my time and I will go over and over and over and over the same thing so that they can see it. And I'll take my time and I will not get tired of doing it because I know that they're trying to understand. But for some others, no. They're never going to be able to hear me because we are not of the same kingdom. We're speaking the same human language, but spiritual things must be spiritual discerned. And on the spiritual level, we have no interpreter between us. Okay, let's continue. We are of God. He that knoweth God, heareth us. He that is not of God, heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in God's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Now you might be wondering, Maurice, what does that have with the verse that you just read? Here's what it has. It says, He that is of God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. A while back in one of our studies, I emphasized that the kingdom of God has no embassy on earth, that there are no ambassadors on earth. And of course, I explained that when I said that, what I meant is that the kingdom of God is not interacting and negotiating and having any dealings with the kingdom of Satan. Not doing any trade or... <laughs> right. There's no kind of... Interaction. Interaction between them. And Jesus made this plain, didn't he? However... In this verse, you see where it says here in verse 20, Now we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. When it says here that we are ambassadors for Christ, we are not ambassador to the world. We are ambassador to the lost. There's a difference. There are some people in this world that if God himself would come down in front of them, they would still not believe. We are not sent to those people. We are sent to those who will be saved. 
those who when they hear the word of God, they recognize it to be true. They recognize it to be what they're missing. When they hear the word of God, they hear the voice of Jesus Christ and they respond. Those are the people to whom we are ambassadors. Those are the people that Jesus referred to when he says, other sheep I have who are not of this fold. Exactly. Those are the people who are ambassadors too. Not to the world, not to the darkness, not to Satan. Get me? And that's why I wanted to show you this, because I want to emphasize again that you are not sent to the world as into the other kingdom. When we go to the other kingdom, we don't go as ambassadors we go as warriors. We go as, for want of a better analogy, we go as SEAL Team 6. We're going there to infiltrate, to break the captive free, not to negotiate with the enemy. We never ever negotiate with the enemy. As I told you last week, if Satan himself appeared to me right now, I would not say, I rebuke you, Satan. I would not say hi. I would not say bye. I would only say, to God, help me, and God will deal with Satan, but I won't deal with Satan. Why? Because that's not my duty. My duty is to deal with other human beings, not with the devil. That's big time stuff, and I'm a little guy. All right, one more, Ephesians 6, 19 to 20. That you were going to talk about the new man in Christ. Oh, you know, so my wife said that we should speak about the new man in Christ. If you are of God, my little children, the first thing you become is a little children. The first thing you become is a new creature. The first thing you become is a new man. You what? are new, which means that you're not the same as you were yesterday. What am I talking about? Your nature has changed. Your heart has changed. Your priorities have changed. Not that you have changed them. That's not you. You can't change you. As the good prophet says, the leopard cannot change his spot, neither the Ethiopian his skin. So too cannot those who are used to doing wickedness turn around and do good. You can't change yourself. These changes are manifested by God, not by us. But he makes you into a new creature. He gives you a new heart. And that is when you become a child of God. That is when you switch kingdoms. That is when you will hear when the people of God speak. That is that new birth experience that being born again is all about. Yeah. And just like the butterfly, because I think the butterfly is one of the few creatures that God made that demonstrates born again. Remember, the butterfly was first a caterpillar, right? And he was crawling around and eating leaves and going about his daily business then once he gets into his cocoon guess what folks here's something strange that i learned this week when the butterfly gets into a cocoon do you know what happened in that hard shell in the cocoon in metamorphosis I, that's what they always taught me but it's more than that he actually liquefies so he turns into a liquid and then he turns back into a solid you see, it's a complete change. They're genetically the same. They're genetically the same, but they're physically different. All right. So when he comes back as a butterfly, he is so different from what he was before that if you didn't know about this process and someone showed you a caterpillar and a butterfly and said, hey, that's the same creature, you said, no, 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 you are crazy. That's obvious not the same creature. One eat leaves... The other drinks nectar. One crawls around, the other flies around. One is ugly and lumpy, the other one is the epitome of beauty. That's us, folks. That's us. That's the change that God makes in our lives. We were lumpy, ugly creatures crawling around, but when Jesus comes into our lives, we are now set free and we fly in the beauty of holiness. All right, let's go to our next verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now, what we will find, and I mentioned this the last time, is that John keeps harping. 
is like an old grandma. Love me one another. Love one another. He doesn't stop. Hey, love one another. Every time you turn around, love one another. Why? He is not saying love God, love God, love God. He's saying love each other. Because that is the most important thing. That is the thing that is going to show that you are of God. Because folks, what he's saying is that you cannot love each other truly unless you're first born again of God. Because remember I told you and I showed you where the Bible tells us that our duty is to love each other in the same way that God loved Jesus. Remember I showed you that? And he's saying that when you have that type of love for each other, that proves that you are of God. True love can only come from God because true love has no strings, no prerequisites, no recompense. You understand folks? I've told people this for so many years that the reason why we can't understand God is not because God is complicated. It's because God is simple and we tend to complicate everything. God is saying that when you are born again in my kingdom, the first thing that manifests itself in you is love. And that love is reflected on how you love each other. You see that, folks? Not how you love God, because a lot of us, a lot of us, come on, folks, go out there. Everybody love God. You check it out, they can't stand each other. And that's how you know that they're lying. Verse 8. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. Folks, this is another litmus test, isn't it? And I show you that this is why it gets so scary in John. Because when you understand, for example, this line. And you know that you have been a Christian for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And this has never been true in your life. Then all of a sudden, like it or not, you recognize yourself to be a fraud. And that's scary. Because you're comfortable in your own deceit. Because you thought... That all you had to do was love God. And John is here saying, no, that's not the test. You have to love each other. As we saw in chapter 3, and it says, if you don't love your brother who you can't see, how can you say that you love God who you've never seen? Right. Mark you this word that John is using here. He says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. When I say no here, no here is a very intimate term. It's not that you know of God. It's that you know God. So for example, I know of the president. I don't know the president. Get me? But with God, I know God now. So for example, I tell people all the time, I don't believe that there is a God. I know that there is but one God. You see the difference? A lot of people believe that there is a God. But they don't know that God. In fact, before I became a Christian, I knew that there was a God. I just didn't know who he was. I was definitely sure that he wasn't a God in the Bible. But hey, you can be wrong and still go to heaven. John chapter 17, 21 to 23. And we're talking about knowing God. And knowing mean in the Bible here, it means a unity. It means becoming one. It is a knowing that when a man knows his wife, we call that the consummation of the marriage. That is the intimacy that we're talking about. That is why when we say that when he shall appear, we shall know him as we are known. You see, folks, that's talking about intimacy. Now, there are certain things that if you should tell me that my wife did or my wife said, I would tell you, get out of here. You're lying. Why? Because I know my wife. It's the same way that you're going to know God. You're going to know him as intimately, more intimately than the person who you're most intimate with in this world. And this doesn't take a lifetime. It will be almost instantaneous. Go on. John chapter 17, 21 to 23. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Amen. You see, this is what it means to know God, is to become one with God, and one with each other. That, folks, when this happened, we not only know God, we love God, and we love those that are His. Verse 9, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And of course, that is what? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, that He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him may not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, folks, let me just emphasize again from what we did last time when we talked about David saying that he can't give something to God that didn't cost him anything. It's the same thing that God is saying to us here when he sent Jesus Christ to us. He sent his only begotten Son. In other words, Jesus is unique in all creation. Jesus is a one of a kind. It cost God something when God had to give him up for us. You say he's a one of a kind that seems to contradict that he's just like us. No, no, no. You have to separate Jesus in heaven and Jesus on earth. Remember, before Jesus became man, before he came to earth, who was he? He was the creator, remember? All things were made by him. And without him was nothing made that was made. You see, he is the creator. God spoke it, Jesus did it. Okay, he created everything. Then, when we fell, God sent him to redeem us. To redeem the people that he had made. When he came to us, when he came to earth, he didn't come as the creator. He took all of that aside, he put it down... And he came as one of us. Took off his divinity. Right. Took off all his power. Took off all of that. And he came just like one of us. When you say he was unique, then what was unique about him? Because he is the one who made all things. Okay. Catch it. Jesus is making so, everything. So, so everything that exists cannot be like Jesus because Jesus made it. You see that? He is unique. So when God sent him, remember when God sent him, God wasn't sending the creator. God was sending the human. When he came, he came as a human. Okay, verse 10, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. And of course, the propitiation is just the payment, the ransom, the price of our sins. But catch this. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us. Folks, it is no mystery why we love God. As Satan said to Job, Yeah, he served you because you give him stuff. Why do I love God? I love God because he made me. I love God because he saved me. I love God because he's given me eternal life. There's a lot of reason why I love God. And it's all one-sided. Yeah, it's a one-sided transaction. The question now is, why does God love me? And as I have told you not long ago, I can't actually come up with one good reason, well, one reason why God loves me. Because he made me. No. He made me and that's exactly why you shouldn't love me. Because I am a disappointment. Because I have fallen so far from what he had intended. Folks, look at it practically. Look at it. Remove your ego. Every now and again, I build something. I make something. Every now and again, my wife makes dinner. If I'm making something or if my wife is making dinner... And it doesn't come out how it's supposed to. You know what she does? She throws it in the garbage. 
because it's not good. It's not what I intended. Every now and again, I'm making something. It's not exactly looking as though I want it to look. You know what I do? I break it and I throw it in the garbage and I start over. That should have been God's reaction when we messed up. It was easier, folks, for him to just crush everything up and start afresh. Because, folks, catch this. He made everything in six days. He has been working hard day and night for 6,000 years to save us. Now, I'm not as smart as God, but hey, 6,000 years versus 6 days, I would have just crushed it up and redo it in another 6 days. We probably would have only had to erase the 6 days. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but for some strange reason, God loved us. And this, I think, is the only thing that God has ever done that made the angels scratch their heads. And that is why the Bible tells us, what is man? Speaking of God, what is man? In other words, they're arguing with God. God, come on, man. What is man? That thou art mindful of him. And the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and have crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hand. Thou hast put all things under his feet. The angels are saying, God, are you okay? You see, this is the only thing I truly think are all the annuals of eternity that has ever baffled the angels is God's reaction to us sinful human beings. And think about it. Not only has he been working for 6,000 years to save us, he risked his entire kingdom, his entire dominion when he sent Jesus to save us. Because he sent him defenseless. Because he sent him as a man. And if Jesus Christ had slipped once, what happened to Adam would have happened to him. But instead of Satan gaining the earth, through Adam's fall, Satan would have gained heaven through Jesus' fall. God, what is man that you are mindful of him? And so let's continue. First John chapter 4 verse 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So here John is still harping on to love one another. Little granny running us down. Love one another. He doesn't stop. Love one another. Verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. No, folks. The first part, no man has seen God at any time. That is what my wife referred to where God asked, If you can't love those who you have seen, how can you love God who you haven't seen? Okay? But he goes on and he says, we ought also to love one another. Why? Because God loved us. In other words, folks, look at it this way. I have to step back and look at what God did for me. And when God saved me, I know I was not worthy. But yet still God loved me. And so when I look at my fellow men, guess what, folks? They're not worthy because they're jerks. But so am I. And if God could love me, then surely I can love them. Because... They are no worse than I am. Alright? And so we are just passing it on. Verse 12. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. So when it says that his love is perfected in us, here's what this means, folks. What is man that thou art mindful of him? He's a disappointment. But God is saying, no. Even though he fell... Yet still, he can still be all I made him to be and more. And when he accepts my son Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and I remake him into the image of Jesus Christ, then you will see that the love that I have bestowed on him is well spent. That's what he's saying, that his love is perfected in us, is intent for us at the beginning is finally true in you and I when we love each other. 
And our final verse for today is John chapter 4 verse 13. And it says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. Hereby know we that we dwell in God and God in us because he has given us of his spirit. Folks, if you do not have the spirit of God living in you, you are not a child of God. It's as simple as that. Because remember, the spirit of God is the down payment of your redemption. It is the proof positive that you have been born again. And if you remember, 1 John chapter 3 actually ended with this very same sentiment where it said, And he that keepeth his commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him. Hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. The Spirit of God, folks, and I emphasized last week that your pastors probably told you that when you were baptized you received the Holy Spirit, and I told you that's not true. It could be true. But chances are, didn't happen. And that is why your Christian life has been a struggle from day one. You know the things to do, but you can't do them. You know the things that you're not supposed to do, but you keep doing them. Why? Because the Spirit of God does not abide, does not live, does not remain in you. Because you never received them. And if you know this to be the truth, it's no time to get despondent, it's no time to get angry, it's no time to get stiff-necked. It's a time to go down on your knees and petition God that he will send you his Holy Spirit. Because as I told you, God is more willing to give you of the Holy Spirit than you're willing to ask. But God will not willy-nilly just dish out the most precious thing that he have just because you ask for it. In order for God to give it to you, God must see that if you don't get it, you will die. It is Jacob in the wilderness. I will not let you go unless you bless me. I don't care how powerful you are. I don't care what you do to me. I got to have it because I cannot live one more day without it. That is a kind of desperation that you need in order for God to give you of his precious Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying, folks? God can't just give you the Holy Spirit just because you ask. Why? Once you're going to consume it on your own lust. <laughs> because you're going to end up in a hotter place in hell if your heart isn't right. God can't send this Holy Spirit to live in that heart that you have now. Because you're not born again. You have to go back to step one. You know, I play soccer all the time. And sometimes your game is just off. I always tell people, when your game is off like that, you either need to spend five minutes on the bench or you need to go back to basic. Control, pass, control, pass. Build up a rhythm and then you can go back fully into the game. But you have to go back to basic. And this is now, folks, you recognizing why your spiritual game has been off all your life. Why? Because you don't have the spirit. So you have to go back to basic. You have to go back to repentance. You have to go back to contrition. You have to go back to seeking the Lord. No shame in that. The only shame in it is if you don't do it. Because if you don't do it, you will be ashamed because Jesus Christ will not know you on that great day. Romans 8 verses 14 through 16 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen. Amen. And so, folks, before we sign off for today, I just want to read again 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. Because this can be very, very confusing because of the he's and him here. So let me read it again. And I'll put in God where God belongs so that you can see him clearly. And he that keepeth God's commandment dwelleth in God and God in him. And hereby we know that God abideth in us by the spirit which God has given us. Which God has what? Given us. 
And folks, if you have not received the Holy Spirit, I encourage you, do what I say. Go on your knees, petition God, pursue Him, pursue Him, pursue Him, pursue Him. Folks, plead, beg, grovel. This is the only time in your life that is actually going to be justified. And that's exactly what He will do. He will justify you. And so until we meet again, may God bless you and keep you. May make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Walk with the King and be a blessing. Goodbye.